what we do here is go back, 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 back. back. Hey y'all, Champ Ron, the Minding Your Business Podcast. This is episode number 127. Coming to you at uh, a very uh, challenged and difficult time uh, with the events uh, of today. Hope everybody nonetheless has had an enjoyable weekend. I hope that you're ready to get this week started off uh, as we're recording this uh, at roughly 1038 Central Time on Sunday, January the 26th of 2020. Earlier today, it was reported initially by TMZ and then later confirmed by some more uh, media outlets, uh, including ESPN and Adrian Wojnarowski that there was a helicopter crash um, out in California, out on the West Coast. And on that helicopter contained nine individuals. Of those nine individuals um, included in those nine individuals were NBA retired legend, Los Angeles Lakers, great, and future Hall of Famer, Academy Award-winning Hall of Famer, Kobe Bean Bryant, along with his daughter, his 13-year-old daughter, Gianni, uh, referred to and commonly referred to as Gigi. They were two of the nine passengers on the helicopter. So today went into a frenzy and as you can imagine with social media and things like that, um, Kobe Bean Bryant was 41 years old. He was going to turn 42 later this year. And again, his daughter was 13. And then you had seven other passengers that were on the helicopter that crashed. Um, fairly quickly, fairly swiftly, and there were no survivors. So many of you are listening to this podcast, and of course, this is a business podcast here with the Money Your Business podcast. But as you know, from time to time, I have done these episodes, unfortunately, when there has been life transition. I haven't done it all, all the time. Um, but I have done it uh, quite frequently um, as it refers to um, transitions of people who were um, very influential and impactful, um, particularly on my life and many of the lives of many others. And so um, I learned of the news. I was actually on the phone with a good friend and business colleague, Mr. Uh, Gilbert Carter, who's a a friend of the podcast, has been on the podcast as a guest on multiple occasions now. And I was on the phone with him and I received a call um, from my wife, my dear wife, um, who called me and asked me a question that I hear about the news. And of course, you know, these days and times, there's uh, many things that you could uh, maybe point to as far as news, uh, because there's a lot of things that go on in the world uh, from various time to time and place to place and to various levels. Then um, she said, did you hear the news about Kobe Bryant? And, you know, your first thing is, is maybe he 
came out with a new documentary or um, he, uh, yeah, certainly wasn't talking about coming back to basketball, but maybe he, you know, um, took a position with the Los Angeles Lakers or maybe with another team or um, maybe, uh, you know, if it's something negative, maybe it's something negative related to him or a family member or something like that. So that's my initial thought when I think of um, what may have transpired um, when she asked that question about um, about Kobe Bryant. And so then, you know, as I respond, no, I'm, I'm not aware of any news with Kobe because I had not been on social media looking at any news outlets and I wasn't uh, at that particular time watching TV or television. So I wasn't aware of what had transpired at all. Um, but I pull up ESPN thinking that whatever had tra- would have transpired with Kobe Bryant would have um, taken place in YB you know, on ESPN. It would have been something sports related. And if not, then it would have been just on general news as um, something that uh, – you know, he had done in his post-career endeavors, particularly around uh, creating content. Uh, As we know, Kobe had become a content creator, uh, particularly around things for young people, for youth and for children. And he also had uh, Mamba Academy, uh, which was the gym there that uh, he was providing a a platform and outlet for uh, male and female athletes. So those are the kind of the, the areas that that I'm thinking at the time. Um, I, the last thing that I expected was what I saw when I pull up ESPN and I see uh, what had been reported by Adrian Wojciechowski. Well, shout out to him because of his um, journalistic expertise and his true, authentic sources. Um, he does a great job of getting information out in a mass uh, setting uh, that um, way more times than not is uh, 100% accurate, which other me- media outlets um, can't always say the same thing, at least not with a straight face. All right. So the last thing that I expected to see was what I saw, which was um, Kobe Bryant being on a helicopter that crashed and he did not survive, nor did the other eight passengers, including his 13 year old daughter. Um, let me start out by MYB expressing the sentiments that I'm sure many of you have expressed on social media and you express personally um, that thoughts are with uh, the Bryant family the families of the other seven uh, people that were on the helicopter that did not uh, survive, to the friends of all families involved, to um, particularly the teammates of Gigi, his daughter, to Kobe's teammates, to the Lakers organization, to the NBA family, to all the friends and colleagues and supporters and fans um, express the condolences. And then on behalf of the NYB community, uh, express condolences and thoughts um, with the family and the families uh, involved in what uh, is a, a, to say the least, a a pure tragedy. Kobe Bryant became um, a global icon and you know, as Michael Jordan had opened the door for NBA players becoming global icons, um, Kobe took it to a level um, a lot based on his presence in China, which was um, to say the least, uh, very is huge and is open doors for many NBA players to have international presence, whether it's with their branding, uh, with their name, with their shoes or other apparel and things like that has become a big deal. 
um, internationally, and a lot of that was uh, from Kobe Bryant. Keep in mind, Kobe Bryant was the first guard to, to enter the NBA out of high school. You know, before when guys entered the NBA out of high school, they were um, they were big men. So these were these were big men that were, um, you know, entering the NBA. Kobe coming in as a six five, six six guard out of high school, who also was on the younger side because he was seventeen. Um, he came in at a time when the NBA was going through a transition because you know, remember. Michael Jordan had just come back and had lost in um, the the Eastern Conference second round to the Orlando Magic, to Penny Hardaway and Shaq and that whole team there in 95. So the NBA wasn't sure what Michael Jordan was going to be going forward. Now, we all know the story of what happened. Uh, Michael Jordan went on to win three straight championships and took his throne back. But remember, he had been retired, came back, and that summer, people didn't know what was going to be um, as it related to Michael Jordan. We didn't know. We had no idea what Michael Jordan was going to be. Um, so when it, um, it all transpired, you started to have in 96, which you had that big uh, draft in 96. Um, you picked up kind of a new breed of player. Um, Kevin Garnett that came in the year before. Um, in 96, you had, you know, Kobe Bryant, Ray Allen, um, Allen Iverson, uh, Steve Nash. I mean, just a plethora of guys uh, that came into the league that really uh, impacted the, the culture at the time. So there was a changing of the guard of kind of the, the baby boomer NBA player to now uh, the Gen X NBA player that had different upbringing and different view of the world and had experienced the world through different lenses. And Kobe was at the forefront of that because remember at 17 years old, the stories that were coming out of those early camps, Kobe used to show up and be wearing NBA players out, wearing them out. And so when you hear those type of reports and then the Los Angeles Lakers, who were a good team at the time, they were not quite championship level, but they were heading that way. And remember uh, around that draft time or a little bit after the draft, they had acquired Shaquille O'Neal, who was coming off um, successful years in Orlando with Penny Hardaway and decided as a free agent to go to L.A., so that left a spot open um, when they traded Vlade Diva, who was a Lakers center. They traded him to Charlotte. Charlotte drafts Kobe Bryant and then trades him for Diva and they have all those boys um, on draft night. So he was the 13th pick in the 1996 draft. Early on, and, and what I want to get to is speak to some of the business uh, elements that you could take from Kobe Bryant's career. Um, as he, he's honored, he'll be honored all this week and, and for many years to come. Um, Kobe entered the league. He came to a, a team that then had championship aspirations when you acquire Shaquille O'Neal. So here you've got this talented kid uh, who comes in. He goes to Los Angeles you know, from the East Coast, and – He's on a, a team that's expected to win. You know, most many draft picks, especially lottery picks, typically go to teams that need them right away. They need them to perform. There's a pressure for them to come in right away and start and perform. Kobe didn't have that. Kobe, because he went to a team that had Eddie Jones and Cedric Sabalos and, you know, established guys who could play, Kobe came off the bench. And the Lakers coach at the time, Dale Harris, uh, was a guy that tended to prefer veteran guys. He preferred veterans that um, 
you know, would um, fulfill a lot of those roles. And with Kobe being so young and the feeling that he needed to develop came into play. So anyway, um, so he has a rookie year. He wins the dunk contest, the slam dunk contest, but his minutes are low, so he averages around seven, eight points per game. And he started to get a little bit of playing time in the playoffs that year, if you remember the first round uh, series against the Utah Jazz uh, in 1997. And that was the year the Utah Jazz played the Chicago Bulls. Uh, for what would end up being back-to-back NBA finals. But in that first-round playoff series, if you remember, people remember the air balls that Kobe uh, took. But Kobe had made some shots, too. And Kobe was not afraid to take that shot, whereas other players may have been. So, you know, you run down, you know, the first year, the second year, um, Kobe starts to come into his own. And now you've got a log jam. At positions because you got Nick Van Axel, you got Kobe, you got Eddie Jones, you got you know, you know these guys that are all law jab trying to play the same position, and um, Kobe makes the All Star team as a reserve, as a six man on that team. He still was scoring 15, 16 points a game, so he was coming into his own as a player. And in his third year, um, as those guys were gone, you, you no longer had Eddie Jones and these guys. And, Kobe cements his starter spot. So t- Kobe doesn't become a full-time starter in the NBA till his third year. Um, his fourth year is when the Lakers really took the turn. This was after the lockout of 99. Um, the Spurs had won the lockout year. And then in 2000, the Lakers picked up Glenn Rice. And now they're full-fledged. They got their minds on nothing but championship. I mean, you've got Shaq in his prom. You've got Kobe coming into his own as a young player. You've got established veteran, scorer, and shooter in Glenn Rice. Um, keep in mind they picked up veteran guys like Horace Grant and, you know, A.C. Green and, and, and these guys that know their role and know how to play and provide depth. Um, Derek Fisher's coming to his own. you got Brian Shaw. you got Rick Fox. So you've got a uh, uh, you got some boys that are you know rough riders that know how to go play, and they win their first championship, beating the Indiana Pacers. Now I'm not here to just run down all of Kobe's things. You, you all know a lot of Kobe's career. What I'd like to do today, if anybody that's uh, interested that's listening to the podcast live, if you'd like to um, join in. Uh, let me know. You can call me, 901-299-6822. That's 901-299-6822. And you can join in live and express your uh, sentiments on Kobe Bryant. Um, so feel free to do that, again, if you're listening to this live. If you're not listening to it live and you're listening to the recorded podcast, if you'd like to express your uh, sentiments and condolences and things of that nature, then email me, Ron, R-O-N, at the MYB podcast.com. That's Ron at the MYB podcast.com. And you can express your sentiments uh, to me. It, it, it is, um, it is tough to say the least, you know, just doing this podcast. Um, I have a personal Kobe Bryant story that I, I can share very briefly. I'll give you the the um, the short version. My freshman year in high school, I was a freshman in 1996. The same year Kobe Bryant was a senior in high school. We played in the tournament up uh, in the Philadelphia area, a uh, team that I was on, a um, very young team. And we ran a bracket that included Lower Marion High School of one Kobe Bryant. Of course, we lost the game that had we won, we would have had the opportunity to play Lower Marion and Kobe Bryant. I'll tell you right now, we had nobody on our team that could that had the size and the, the athletic ability and the skill to deal with Kobe. Um, probably several of us would have got that challenge, uh, myself included. Uh, 
to try to defend the guy, but you're talking about a guy that was averaging 33, 34 points per game and just mowing through teams. Uh, he fluctuated between the number one player in the country, the uh, two to three, uh, between him, Tim Thomas, and uh, Rip Hamilton, and, and some of those boys. Um, so it, um, man, uh, getting a chance to, to meet him at that point, um, I didn't know. Because at that point, it wasn't known if he was going to be uh, entering the NBA draft or it had been rumored that he was interested in, in Duke University. And so you really didn't know what he's going to do. I, I kind of assumed he was going to go to college and probably go to Duke or North Carolina. Um, and I kind of leaned towards Duke just, you know, I mean, the guy made a 1400 on the ACT. I mean, or I'm sorry, SAT. He made like a 1400 on it. Uh, SAT. So. I mean, what do you expect the guy to do? He, he definitely has the qualifications to go to a school like Duke, uh, just on academic merit alone, much less, uh, you know, athletics. So you get the chance to meet him, super cool guy. You, you know, we were kids. You know, you say what's up to him. You know, we're competitors. You know what I mean? So you, you know how that's going to be. You know, you go. there's going to be some banter back and forth because – you know, uh, you're all there to do stuff. And, and we had not got an opportunity to play him yet, but um, watching him was was amazing. And then seeing him uh, enter the NBA draft and become what he became, which was an icon and a legend. There played all 20 years in Los Angeles. Um, won five NBA titles. Uh, two finals MVPs, um, MVP of the, the league in 2008, um, career high 81 points in 2006 against the Toronto Raptors. Um, all, multiple all-star game MVPs, um, USA basketball, uh, gold medalist. Uh, on multiple occasions, I think 08 and, and 2012. Um, and then had the Achilles injury in 2013. Um, that, uh, you know, really kind of rocked his career and kind of led towards the, you know, the, the end of his career, those last um, few years, last two or three seasons where um, he was trying to come back from the Achilles and, um, you know, wasn't quite the same at, you know, from an athletic standpoint, um, the miles had taken its toe, toe and, you know, and age and attrition comes into play for everybody. Um, so, you know, it is a, um, it is tough, man. It, it is, it is tough to, uh, you know, to, to have this conversation and anytime we have these conversations of um, someone transitioning in life, man, it is, it is tough. But um, some of the things that um, I take away from Kobe's life that stood out to me, and there are going to be a lot of sentiments all week and really quite frankly, all month and maybe even all year, but certainly this week, a lot of people that were close to Kobe and, where teammates of his and coaches and things like that are all going to speak up. And those are always very interesting people who competed against him. Um, you know, people that were friends of his and uh, friends of his family and, and things of that nature, uh, current players, former players, you know, representatives of the NBA uh, as they all express their sentiments. And then those in the media, of course, but something I like to express that I don't think many people will recognize is that it may not register with many people as it relates to Kobe Bryant. Um, Kobe Bryant has written about and has spoken about and it's been chronicled about what is referred to as the, the Mamba mentality. Um, and when you think about that, 
when you think about the the mama mentality, there's a lot of things that come to mind in terms of um, yeah, ability to focus and your tenacity, yeah, things like that. You're you're not being f- afraid of the moment. You know, all those different things or phrases and mindsets come into play. One of the things that comes to play with me uh, with Kobe Bryant is oftentimes and in our society and then in our culture, we um, generally align having that mentality, that mama mentality, that dog mentality with people that um, grew up in the hood, right? That hood dudes and that kind of thing come with that dog because they, they're, they've never been given anything and, you know, they uh, had to fight, you know, and claw for things. And, you know, like Tony Allen would say, they had to grit, you know, showcase the grit and grind um, that it takes to um, to be successful because you, you, you're not in the position to have any other option. Right. And you come with that toughness and that grit um, from coming from very humble beginnings. And Kobe Bryant is basically the antithesis of that. Remember, Kobe Bryant's dad played in the NBA. So he was one of those early players. Now you've got Steph Curry and you know some other guys whose dad played in the NBA and now they're playing. But at that time, there had not been a, a ton of um, players who had come in the NBA who had legacy like that, whose who's, uh, dad had played in the NBA. There were some, but not, not a lot. Um, and you remember Kobe Bryant has spent a good bit of time overseas. He knew how to sp- speak uh, uh, multiple languages. And he, he did not have that type of upbringing of fight for everything. And, um, you know, you come out of the hood and you, you grit, you grind and you go hard and you, you, you going against this guy, you going against that guy. He didn't come from that. You know, he came from much more of a middle, uh, upper middle class. You know, NBA players had not only made so much back then, but um, he came from those type of beginnings. Kobe did. He he came from a beginning of, um, you know, somewhat of some privilege. Maybe not fully, but you know that. But he had a dad that had played in the NBA, and so he got a bird's eye view of how the league worked. Um, very early on, which you know obviously had to have been a benefit. But one of the things that I always marveled at with him is as someone who did not come from the streets, who did not come from the hood, who did not come from the deep country in the South or any place like that, where he developed that mentality, that, that work ethic and things like that, because that usually comes from someone that has no other choice but that. You know, usually people, and this is a wide generalization, People who come from um, beginnings of, you know, not say excess, but um, where they they don't have to fight and call, and they're not worried about where the next meal came from, and uh, that sort of thing. They tend to not have that type because they tend to adopt a mindset that they have a fallback, or they have a more holistic perspective on life, particularly as it comes to things like sports. Um, But Kobe didn't have that. Kobe had a tenacious obsession with the game of basketball. And he took that. One of the things I was concerned about just as an onlooker, so as a supporter, was how Kobe would do in retirement. You know, because he had such a drive for the game and such a work ethic. You know, what what would he do when he doesn't have that? You know, what would he do? And what, another thing that amazed me about Kobe was the fact that he, um, he he had a plan and he had relationships that allowed him to propel his interest beyond basketball and then use basketball as a platform for new interest as he went into retirement. So he does.
daughters. Um, Kobe's got, uh, he had four daughters. You know, I have three. Um, and for him to dive into content creation as a way to um, not only create a, a second career, but to balance off the career he just came from, you know, 20 years with the Los Angeles Lakers, um, most of that being, you know, all-star, you know, considered the top player of the game for several years. You know, to come out of that, I thought would be tough for him, but it wasn't. He had a very smooth transition in the business and in the content creation, which amazed me. I thought he'd be a guy that would struggle or, you know, all of a sudden you find him working out, trying to see if he could come back in the league and all that type of thing. I, I never thought it would be as smooth for him because many other guys that transition is not as smooth. So I never thought it would be um, – as smooth for him um, as it was. As many other you see what I'm saying? I just never thought it would be that smooth for him. I always thought that it would be, um, you know, a challenge. And so for him to not um, have that as a barrier speaks to that Mamba mentality that he, he had – something else he he loved and, and found a love and, and he began cultivating that prior to retiring that's not something that you just retire and you just say okay what i'm gonna do now i'm gonna start doing uh, children's documentaries i'm gonna write a letter to basketball you know these are things that you have to be planning so myb i tell you as you know someone that's in business and for those of you that are in business um you know, your career may not jump off to the meteoric start like Kobe's. You may become very good at what you do and your business may become very successful. You may become legendary. And then you get to where, how do you reinvent yourself? What's your next act? You may sell your business and then you wonder, okay, what am I going to do now? Maybe your business um, ends at some point, right? Um, you dissolve it, you know, things like that. Or you have a transition with a business partner. Um, the market changes and now new um, trends and new tastes come into play. One of the things you can learn from Kobe is uh, how to transition when you're at the top of your game. You're at the top of the mountain. You've won championships. You've won awards. And now you got to find what's the next act. Because remember, as long as he played, he still retired. He was, what, 37 years old? Most of us don't retire that young, you know what I mean, in our careers. So you retired at 37, and then, you know, unfortunately, Kobe's life was cut short. But, you know, the expectation is you've got another 30, 40, maybe even 50 years of life. And so what are you going to do for those next acts? And Kobe found that. And unfortunately, his life was taken um, too soon because I think he was a brother that was going to do um, you know, many great things and inspire people through his content creation and how he ties that into um, his preparation for um, yeah, ball games and how he viewed the game and the tenacity that he competed with. And one of the things about Kobe, too, when it comes to competition, because he's known as being very competitive, but it wasn't competitive for the fear of losing. And that's something that's different with a lot of people. A lot of people have, they're competitive. They like to compete because solely they have the fear of losing. They don't necessarily have the hatred of losing or the love of winning. They have the fear of losing. And that makes it very, um, uh, I guess, you know, easy to deal with people like that when they've got just solely the fear of losing as opposed to the um, the love of winning and the drive of the tenacity to be the best. And, and one of the things where Kobe and I mirror each other a lot is um, the love of process and how we embrace the process. Not, so, not solely centered on results, although you, you're results driven, but the, the journey for getting there. Kobe often talked about the journey, you know, on championship teams, he'd talk about, 
the journey to get there. And he spent a lot of time, you know, learning some things from Phil Jackson and, and the view of the game and all the Zen stuff and that sort of thing. But th that journey. So in your business, embrace the journey. In life, in your personal life, embrace the journey. Every day is not going to be simple and easy. And life's not designed that way. Life is hard. <laughs> You know, and you don't have to make it. You try not to do things to make it any harder than what it is. But life is hard. Life throws curveballs all the time. And tough times are, are inevitable to come. And this is another one of those tough times where you have someone with his daughter and with seven other people on a helicopter um, whose life transitioned today. And in Kobe's case, is someone that many of us in, in a lot of respects had the chance to watch who we watch grow up and grow up with you know kobe's only two years older than i am i just turned 39 last sunday in wabi so he's only two years older than i am so you you feel like you kind of grow up with the guy and and you see him and uh, you watch his games i can't tell you how many laker games i stayed up to watch um because they came on the west coast and i'm here in central time zone um, but yeah, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, this is going to be a tough one, a tough pill to swallow. And I saw Alicia Keys, uh, do a, a tribute and lead a tribute, uh, to him tonight on the Grammy awards. Uh, so shout out to the Grammy awards and to Alicia Keys for, um, taking time to do that. Um, many of the NBA games, actually all the NBA games today, uh, did some level of tribute to him, whether it's run down the 24 second clock or and or um, moments of silence. Uh, I think in New York, they turned the lights uh, purple and gold on the outside of Madison Square Garden, I believe. So there was just a lot of class all the way around here in Memphis at the uh, FedEx Forum. Uh, the Grizzlies played the Suns and there was um, you know, a moment of a chant for Kobe and that sort of thing. And all those things um, are great with class and, and that sort of thing. So shout out to the NBA and all the teams that did that today and will do so all throughout the week. Um, it was tough seeing uh, Doc Rivers interview, Doc Rivers being the head coach of the Los Angeles Clippers, whose Celtic teams in kind of the late uh, 2008, 9, and 10, and 11 – um, competed very hard against the Lakers. As uh, you know, they beat the Lakers in 2008 in the NBA Finals, and then the Lakers came back and beat them in 2010 in the NBA Finals. And it was tough seeing Doc's reaction because uh, it was so heartfelt, man. And you saw the realism in it. And he's got a locker room full of guys that you know he's got to console, and um, they're dealing with the emotion and the the shock of it all as well. And so. Um, Kobe Bean Bryant, um, 41 years old, uh, transitioned life today. And uh, along with his 13 year old daughter, uh, Gigi, and uh, again, seven other people, um, these were also uh, the, the other people on the helicopter were, you know, I, I think there was also one parent, one dad with a daughter. And as a as a dad of daughters, and this has nothing to do with just the gender. As if you're a parent with of children, of a child or children, you're a caregiver, you're a mentor, you're a teacher, you're an educator of young people. Um, you you run or operate or volunteer for a nonprofit that works with youth. You can only, you, you can't even imagine, none of us can, what it's like to be in that situation. What could be going through your mind as a helicopter starts to malfunction and you start going down? I mean, could you even imagine? I fly on planes pretty much on a monthly basis with my profession. Um, and planes go 30,000 feet in the air. 
And you just never know anytime you step out. You don't know if you're going to make it back. You don't know if you're going to land. You just don't know. And so I'm going to wrap up by saying this, that um, it's one thing to feel bad and to be sad about this tragedy. But tomorrow, if you go out and you're still holding on to grudges from You know, some of y'all are still holding on to grudges so long they, you know, Y2K should have eliminated them, (laughs) right? With the change of the date in the year 2000. Some of y'all still have 1990 and 1980 and 1970 and 1960 and maybe even some 1950 beefs with family and other people, former friends, whatnot. Some of y'all are still bitter about what didn't take place or what was supposed to take place and you know someone was supposed to do this or they were supposed to say that or they didn't do this or they didn't do that and some of y'all are still sitting around bitter about yesterday about 2005 about 1993 about 1982 and here's the thing um life was short before this tragedy and it's still short and every day is an opportunity. Yes, things happen to us and people say things and people make mistakes and all, all that is a part of life. And all of us will need grace at some point. Just keep on going. The only people that don't need grace are people that aren't responsible for nothing. And even then they're going to need some grace at some point. All right. So just remember that um, when you go out tomorrow and you've had a chance to process this tragedy and you've had a chance to mourn the loss and however you choose to do so, hopefully in a healthy, uh, positive way, as positive as you can, hopefully um, you'll take a strong look at your own life and your relationships with your um, significant other, with your children, your child or your children, with your parent or parents, with your grandparent or parents, um, with your coworkers, with your friends, with your um, acquaintances. And you'll think about what kind of legacy you live um, and then what kind of act- legacy that you leave. So one that you live and one that you leave. And you would make the necessarily necessary adjustments if you um, or find yourself in situations where um, you're restrained. Sometimes for just petty BS, you know. Sometimes you're you know you have issues with people for things that you can't even remember what the issue was. You just knew it was an issue and you just determined I'm not talking to this person or they ain't talking to you or whatever. You know, listen, y'all, I, I, I'm not minimizing anything. People go through a lot of things out here. I'm not minimizing anybody's experience. But here's the thing. You, life is so much bigger than um, your personal insecurities or your beefs or your pettiness or any of that stuff. Um, If you're Vanessa Bryant and you're processing the loss of a husband and the loss of a child, if you're the family of any of the other seven people that were on that helicopter and you're processing that transition right now, um, life become it's so much bigger than the things that we have hangups over, and the, the things that we try to divide ourselves on. The politics, the race, the gender, the sexuality, single versus married. Everything's an either or with us sometimes. Everything's versus. Everything's a competition. 
It's either or. You know, it's black and white. And there's so much more that unites us than divides us. That there's, we all have a common goal, and that common goal is we want to um, progress our the human race, right? Um, we want to be just a little better for our families, um, for our communities, and for ourselves. We all have that common um, goal, no matter what you look like in the mirror. So if you're mourning Kobe Bryant's transition and the transition of those on the helicopter, but you go out tomorrow and you hate someone because they're white or because they're black or because they're short or because they're tall or because they're old, because they're young, because they, they're not from the side of the tracks that you're from, take a hard look at your life, man, and think about um, what kind of legacy you want to leave? Because you don't have to be old and sick to leave here. You really don't. And no, none of us have a lease on. You know. You know what I mean. We we have no. Um, you know, this is a privilege. This is not a birthright that you will live forever. That and that you live to to become an old person. Think about that, MYB, as you, you're building your business, as you're uh, maybe you're in the workforce, uh, you're looking uh, you know, your next promotion. You know, but think about these things. Think about your mindset and how you treat people. Everybody. Think about that and think about, um, you know, Kobe's life. Um, think about his ability to work in different cultures, um, his ability to form relationships, no matter what the other person looked like in the mirror, and then his tenacity for achievement and the process that it takes to, to achieve. Think about those things. And as you do that, um, Let's remember Kobe Bean Bryant. Let's remember his daughter, his 13-year-old daughter. And let's remember the seven other people that have been confirmed that were on the helicopter who, again, all lost their lives. May they all rest well in their next phase of life because death is a part of life. So as they transition through the death process, whatever that next phase is, we don't know, but whatever that next phase is, may they uh, find the peace in that. May their families, the spouses, the, uh, the husbands, the, the mothers, the fathers, the, the children, the cousins, the, uh, the aunts, the uncles, may they all find a, a peace of serenity as they deal through this transition that it's obviously very public. So MYB, thank you so much for hearing me out today on this podcast, um, episode 127, uh, Dear Mamba. Um, I'll, I'll miss Kobe. He was, um, you know, again, someone you look up to, someone that you, you try to pattern how you do things and that that same Mamba mentality, that same tenacity you try to have in your personal and professional life, even with all our flaws. And Kobe was not without him and nobody on the helicopter was not without him. None of us are, are not without him. We all have. Him. But even through the flaws, how he was able to achieve to be a champion. And that's what I always remember uh, about Kobe being Bryant was someone that was a, a champion in all phases of life and demanded that of himself and of the people around him. And that's the legacy that he leaves is one of excellence. Um, and my heart goes out again to the family 
um, of his, you know, for his family with the transition of their daughter at 13 years old, who will not have the opportunity to finish school. Um, definitely shout out to her classmates and her teammates on her basketball team who tomorrow are having to deal with the loss of a classmate and the loss of uh, a friend to her sisters who have to deal with at such a young age, uh, the loss of a sister. It's just, it's very tough, man. But um, we will all make it through. And what our responsibility is, is to live. And that's what this podcast is about. It's about, uh, and this particular episode, MYB, is how do we go then and live? So after you're done listening to this and, you know, that sort of thing, think about how you're going to go live. Yeah, we all we all will die one day. That's what I'll question. Everybody that's born will die. That's the inevitable piece. It's what we do in between time. All right. Listen, thank you so much. Again, share this uh, podcast with uh, others in your network. Make sure that they're aware of it. Um, Subscribe. Uh, on any of the platform, major platforms where you get your podcast. Go to themybpodcast.com to see more content and more information about the Mind Your Business podcast, including how you can advertise. And of course, we're powered by the Binge Podcast Network uh, at onabinge.com. Shout out to um, our flagship podcast and now radio show, uh, the Startup Life, which is hosted by Dominic Lawson and also his great wife, Kenda. Thank you all so much, Champ Ron, on a Sunday, January the 26th. And uh, rest in love, Kobe Bean Bryant, his daughter, and the seven other people uh, in today's helicopter crash tragedy. What we do here is go back, 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 back.